welcome you also to the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, which is an actual department here at UCL, and value how it's co-created by different actors in the economy, and also how we share that collectively created values come, um, comes to the center of what we do. And we try to bring these concepts of value and public purpose to the center of how we think about both political economy, but also policy making. And so we're extremely happy to have Heather uh, present her book at the Institute. And just before I forget, after the event, which we're going to stop at 8 o'clock sharp, you're all welcome to come for drinks and canapes across the street in the Bartlett in the main reception area. Now, the reason I am so happy to uh, present to you Heather and her book called Unbound, How Inequality Constricts Our Economy and What We Can Do About It, is both what the book is about, but also how Heather and I met, which I'll leave um, for the end of this brief introduction. First of all, how Heather approaches the topic of inequality is extremely important because too often we look at it as an effect of uh, problems. And then we worry about things like redistribution and uh, bargaining power and the problems that might happen with different types of tax structures. And what Heather does, which again kind of goes to the core of also how we look at the economy, is to really think about all the opportunities and the lack of creativity that come about, so the lack of wealth creation itself widely defined beyond the narrow ways that usually we think about wealth when we have inequality, all the opportunities that are actually lost for the economy. And that kind of way of thinking about inequality as having a problem ex ante, not just ex post, and how we can fundamentally change our economies to um, not just reduce inequality, but to fundamentally redirect the economy to produce more innovation, more sustainable trajectories is, I think, what's very unique in her writing. Um, she's currently the head of a very active policymaking institution called the Center for Equitable Growth in DC. Um, and it's a think tank, but again, very active on the policymaking front. In fact, Heather herself was Hillary Clinton's chief economist when everyone thought Hillary was going to win. So she was the chief economist for Hillary's transition team when, in theory, there was going to be a transition into government before Trump uh, won. Um, and uh, besides this book called Unbound, she also wrote a book called Finding Time, The Economics of Work-Life Conflict, and co-editor of a great book called After Piketty, The Agenda for Economics and Inequality. And both were published by Harvard. So how Heather and I met, and why it's really great to talk <laughs> with Heather and kind of reminisce about our youth, is we were both working in a trade union called the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union, Act Two before it became Unite, back in 1992? 1992. 1992. And she was working on technological change, and I was working on social policies. And the problem was that I wasn't very interested, or I, it's not that I wasn't interested. My passion was technological change, which is what I do now, the economics of innovation. And what she was really interested in was health policies and social policies and how to redesign them. So one day, we were sitting in Union Square in New York City, and we were eating our lunch and kind of pretending we were very happy and everything was fine. And then we slowly realized that both of us would have loved the other one's job. So we literally just said, let's swap. <laughs> and history yes. then happened, right? So I ended up becoming obsessed with rethinking innovation systems and looking also at the different theories. And, and Heather's work actually on inequality, I think, very much stems from that period and looking at, for example, the social consequences of things like health inequality. Um, anyway, so we're going to structure this as follows. Uh, Heather will be speaking for 35 minutes, then we're going to have a bit of back and forth between us for 15 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to you guys for a full 35 minutes, and then we're all going to move over to the reception uh, place to drink and eat whatever is there. So without <laughs> further ado, Heather. I want to start by just a few notes on um, uh, who I am and why, what, like why I wrote this book. It's always good to know why an author wrote their book um, as you get started. Um, as Mariana noted, I run an organization called the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. We launched in November of 2013 um, with the goal of understanding whether and how inequality affects economic outcomes. And we have a very unique institutional strategy. We work with academics, um, mostly in the United States but all over the world, who um, we fund and we um, do working papers and seminars and a lot of things to encourage investigation of this question of all the different ways that inequality affects our economy. And we start with this question because for the past 40 years, we've been, or more, but essentially very much for the past 40 years, 
We've been told this story that what drives economic growth is making sure that those um, who are the job creators, who have the wherewithal to invest, have enough resources to do that, they aren't taxed too much, they've got all their money, and they're, not, they're free from any kind of limiting regulations or state interference that would get in the way of the kinds of investments that are going to create this strong, stable, and broadly shared growth. And yet we know that over um, uh, recent decades, that hasn't always worked. That this idea that if you give people who have money more of it, that they'll invest it, hasn't necessarily, that we have, we have a lot of questions about it. And that is where our organization starts, is, well, so is this an adequate theory of what makes the economy grow? And if not, why not? But what do we know about the ways that inequality in all of its forms affects investment, affects consumption, affects the development of human capital, affects various economic outcomes? <laughs> So over the past six years, we have funded over 200 scholars. Um, we've given away about five and a half million dollars um, to investigate this question. And the book is a culmination of my learning and the learning of my team on, you know, what do we know? So, um, and I will note it's a culmination of the learning thus far. Um, my hope in talking about this book and talking to you all today um, is that there'll be a lot of interesting questions and debate. Because I think this question of what role inequality plays in our economy and our society could not be more important, given the trends that we've been seeing. And getting these answers right is imperative. So I don't claim to have all the right answers, but I have a set of answers that I think are right, but I'm very curious to hear from others. Um, so um, I want to give a few contextual data points to get this conversation started. So I'm going to give a series of statistics that focus on the US context. Um, uh, that look at what inequality looks like. So what do we know about it? That sort of starts this question about what does this mean for our economy? We need to know what we're talking about. So um, the first data point I'm going to show is um, this is on the x-axis is the um, income distribution or you know the, the population, so from low income to high income. And on the vertical axis is average annual income growth. That purple horizontal line, it's 1.7% average annual growth in aggregate national income between 1963 and 79. And you can see in the 1960s and 70s, the United States was a country that grew together. Over two thirds of people saw their incomes grow at about the average. And if you're rich, you saw your incomes grow less. And if you were poor, you saw your incomes grow more. So there are three very significant changes in these trends since 1979. The first one, which we don't talk about enough, is that aggregate income growth is actually slowed. So in the period between 1963 and 79, national income grew on average by about 1.7%. Since then, going to 2016, which is the latest data we have available for this series, it's only been 1.3%. So we've seen a slowdown in overall aggregate national income. At the same time, we've also seen this dramatic rise in inequality. And there are two elements of this chart that I want to draw your attention to. So, um, well, first, you can see that purple horizontal line that's at 1.3%. This is, again, from 1980 to 2016. And what you see is, first, all people that earn below the 90th percentile have incomes that are now less than the average. So that means that last week, when the United States Bureau of Economic Analysis went out and said, oh, US gross domestic product, which is about akin to national income, doesn't count depreciation and the like, but essentially the same concept. When they went out and said GDP grew by 1.9% in the last quarter, you can know that based on prior trends, that 90% of people in the United States actually saw their incomes grow by less than that, right? By less than 1.9%. Whereas in the period of the 60s and 70s, if GDP grew by 1.9%, most people would have seen that experience that income. So one is that uh, the aggregate story no longer tells the whole story. The second point, of course, is that this is a country that's growing apart, right? Um, those at the very top are seeing the strongest income gains, and those at the bottom are seeing the slowest income gains. So this is not only um, a country that's unequal, it is widening in a very specific way. So that is the first trend. Um, I want to go, I'm going to go fairly quickly through a few other um, grounding trends. I'm assuming that you all have some familiarity with economics. 
Um, but I'm happy to slow down or to go through it in the Q&A, and I'm happy to make the slides available. But I want to go through these things quickly so that I can get to what this means and what this story tells us about what makes the economy grow. So the next data point is a chart showing the decline in absolute upward mobility in the United States. So from this chart, we know that if you were born in 1940, about 90% of people grew up to out-earn their parents. If you were born in 1980, only about half of people are now out-earning their parents at about the same age. That is a dramatic decline in the share of people who are moving up over a very short period of time. So we live in a country in the United States now where the aggregate no longer tells a story of what's happening. People are going further apart, and the probability of moving up has fallen sharply. We've also seen this dramatic rise in wealth inequality. So alongside this growing income inequality and the lack of upward mobility, you see this concentration of resources in a smaller and smaller number of families. And I want to draw your eye to this bottom, the bottom 50%. This is from 1989 to 2019, new data from the US Federal Reserve. Those folks in the bottom half, bottom half of the wealth distribution in the United States have, in, have wealth today that is the same in inflation adjusted term you know, as it was back in 1989 while the top has seen a nearly 300% increase in their wealth. That is a massive amount of wealth concentration. But it's not just that we've seen inequality in incomes and in wealth, what's happening on the family side. We've also seen a rising concentration across firms. Um, so you know, what we mean by this, of course, is that you see fewer and fewer firms dominating in various parts of our economy. So this is an aggregate indicator. Um, it's an index across industries of market concentration from 1985 to 2015, but just gives you a sense of the scale and scope of the rise in market concentration. Of course, this isn't just, all of these trends aren't just in the United States, but I'm focusing on what I know best. Um, and. Uh, so, and of course, these three go together, because alongside this rise in market concentration, you see a rise um, in um, how dividends are, you know, the, the, the dividends are then distributed to those owners of those firms, which is connected to the income and wealth stories. So what we see is an economy that across all sorts of axes has become increasingly unequal. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what does this mean for economic outcomes? So this is, this is interesting, and it says something about lived experience, and we assume that it says something about well-being for families. But what does it actually mean for the economy in the next instance? If we start from the question of what the distribution of incomes and wealth and across firms look like today, what does that mean for our economy moving forward? And to preview the conclusion that I make in the book, what we see is that um, over the past few decades, there's been an explosion in economics of new kinds of research and evidence uh, based in large part on new empirical research, bigger data sets, much more access to computing power, methodologies that allow us to show causality. And economists have been increasingly able to look at what we would call heterogeneity, right? Look at something that's different across some axis. And that research has led to a new series of conclusions you can draw from that research on what inequality means. And that's what I'm going to outline um, for the rest of the talk. Um, I will argue that um, from where we sit um, at Equitable Growth and the work that we're doing with economists, uh, I will argue that it appears that we could be in the midst of a paradigm shift within how economists are thinking about the economy. And I say this for a number of reasons. One, economics used to be a discipline that was based on theory, not evidence. Right? So in the 1960s, over half of papers in the top three journals were theoretical and super important. But today, if you look at the top journals, the vast majority are empirical. And not just using like one survey data from the government, which is what was sort of in the early years of empirical work people were doing. Economists are creating their own data. They have access to big administrative data sets. So the, the field itself has been able to um, in many ways, when you start, when you, when you see more and more empirical work, it's pushing on the boundaries of where theory was. You see um, increasingly scholars doing that. And that's where Thomas Kuhn writes, we see these paradigm changes, when you see these empirical anomalies at the edge of the discipline. And I would argue that what we're seeing at the cutting edge of the profession, in many ways, is that. Um, the other thing that um, 
I would argue about it is that you see that, wait, hold on, now I'm not, I've lost my notes. Um, mm -hmm. this is, you know, you always go off the notes. Um, the other thing that I would argue is that part of the reason that I think we're seeing a paradigm shift now is that many of the theories that we have about how the economy works that you see in a standard economics textbook were developed in the early part of the 20th century at a time when the economy looked very different. We were an economy that was much more equal, right, across the United States, across European countries, where the places where people were making those theories. And one of the things, the conclusions that I've come to in this book that I think is something that I'm still exploring, is like the next iteration, is that if you have a set of theories that are, that are grounded in an era of, high of, high, of greater equity, it may be that your systems, it may be that labor markets work in a particular way or market uh, competition works in a particular way because you have institutions that are constraining inequality. But if you've spent 40 years tearing down those very institutions that constrain inequality and allowed it to mushroom, it may be that the theories that you have about how the economy work no longer resonate in this new economic environment. So that these, these inequality trends mean that the environment in which the, the economic activity is happening has changed markedly. So let me go through some of the evidence on why I have come to these conclusions about a paradigm shift and about how um, our theories no longer make as much sense in, uh, in this new context. So um, I'm going to show you there. So uh, I went to that slide too quickly. So there are three buckets in which I'm going to make the argument that inequality constricts growth. The first one is what I think of as the most obvious, the easiest to kind of wrap our heads around. It's sort of the, it's the, it's the one that we're all familiar. Inequality constricts growth by obstructing the supply of people and ideas into the economy and limiting opportunity for those not already at the top, which slows productivity growth over time. And in the book, each of the, so I have six substantive chapters, and in the first two I focus on, um, in each chapter I focus on a scholar whose work is emblematic of this new finding, and then sort of build out what we're learning from the research. And so here, I focus on work by, um, and I just, this is a little graphic that our designer did, I, I really like it, it's a little mm -hmm. baby who's got limited opportunity and the, the, the low income baby, maybe you can't read it so well from above, it's cute though, at any rate. So um, there I focus on, you know, what is it that we know about how inequality constrains opportunity? And I start with this work by Janet Curry, she's an economist at Princeton University, labor economist, she focuses a lot on human capital. And she did this really interesting study on what happened to children, what she wanted to know whether or not pollution affects human capital. If you are exposed to pollution as a young child or in utero, how does that affect human capital development? Well, one body of her research shows that um, children who are born at a lower birth weight, we can trace through their lifetime, all else equal, they will have lower employment and earnings. This is not to say that, that your life is predestined by the birth weight, but that all else equal, children on average who are born at low birth weights tend to have lower employment and earnings outcomes later on in life, you know, unless there are um, interventions. And so she wanted to know whether or not pollution, because so many children who are low income live in neighborhoods where they're more exposed to pollution, what does this do? So, natural experiment. She looks at children born to the same mother before and after 9-11. She does this with a, with a co-author. Um, because, because you're controlling for the mom and the neighborhood where this child is, is living and finds that those children that were born in neighborhoods affected by the ash um, from the uh, demise of the Twin Towers, those children who were born right after 9-11, who were exposed to this in utero, were born at lower birth rates relative to their siblings who were born before 9-11 happened. And so from that she infers that we can say with a high degree of um, certainty that this form of inequality, exposing to children um, to pollution when they're in utero, which is an effect of inequality, has an effect on our economy later on in life. So I start there because it's this really brilliant pulling together of new data using these natural experiments and sort of is so emblematic of the kind of credibility revolution we've seen in economics. Another one of the studies that I, that I focus on in the next chapter, which we um, uh, were able to support in a small part, done by Raj Chetty and a number of his colleagues. He wanted to understand how does that we create innovators? Like what makes an innovator? And what is the role of inequality in innovation? So Raj and his team got data on who becomes an innovator, who gets a patent, and who applies for a patent, who receives it. 
and they connected that data on patent receipt to whether to that person's income as an adult. Then they connected that data to their third grade math test scores and to the parental income when that person was in third grade. So they know third grade math test scores, parental income, and then they know whether or not that person grows up to be an inventor and what kind of job they got in their income. Well, so um, first they find the obvious. Kids that do really good on third grade math test scores much more likely to grow up and be an inventor, right? Those kids are the ones that are, they're out inventing things. Okay, that's sort of, you know, it, it connects with common sense. These children have aptitude. Then if you look at just the kids that scored high on that third grade math test, um, uh, and they looked at it by race, by gender, by income, they found that the kids that scored high on that test who came from high income families four times as likely to grow up to be an inventor as the ones from lower income families. And so they title this paper, The Lost Einsteins, <laughs> right? And you think about it, it's not just the loss of productivity to our economy from those children not inventing things, but those children are coming from different places in our society. Boys more likely to, to grow up to be inventors than girls of those high math scores. White children more likely to grow up and be inventors than children of color of those kids that, that have that aptitude. That means that the kinds of goods and services that maybe women like or people of color like or that would serve low income communities where people are from with their own life experiences, those things may not be being invented because the people that have that, that knowledge about those communities are somehow along the way being denied this opportunity. And our economy is losing all this productive value. I'm going to connect that to, a, 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 just hold that thought. I'll come back to sort of what we, what we lose on the, the inventing uh, later on. But I think it's very powerful research. And again, this is just emblematic of what we're learning about the ways that inequality is constricting growth through obstructing opportunity. So first, these obstructions. So then second, inequality constricts growth by subverting the institutions that manage the market. And this, I think, is where some of your work comes in, Mariana, um, that it's making our political system ineffective and our markets dysfunctional. And so here, there's a lot of evidence from a lot of different sources. Um, in, in, in one of these chapters, I got to do a very nice deep dive into the political science literature, which as an economist was super fun, um, and seeing what is it that we know about inequality and what that does to our ability to make the investments that we as a society want to make and need to make that improve economic outcomes. So one of the things that we see in the United States is that actually public investment is at a new low. So this chart is going back to 1947, and it's U.S. gross government investment, federal and state, as a share of gross domestic product from 1947 to 2018. So this is a downward sloping um, chart here. Um, so even as we have needs to invest, um, the United States has been falling behind in all sorts of those uh, international uh, assessment tests of school children, falling behind in our investments in early child care. Um, we have bridges that fall down as people are driving over them. We have a massive need to invest in infrastructure and the like, and yet we've not been making these investments. And so when you tease out the story of why, and why, what, how it is that we're making decisions about what we're doing, so much of it comes back to this question of inequality and wealth. So um, in one particular case, uh, uh, we worked with this um, uh, scholar uh, who studied elites in the city of Chicago. And um, they studied the top 1% in Chicago and found that of this group of people in the top 1% in Chicago, which is in one of the largest states in the country, in, in Illinois, um, over half of them had had some contact with their senator. And I can't actually have not gone back to look up the study. In my imagination, it was that they had the senator's cell phone number, but I think it was just that they had had some like face-to-face -face or personal contact with them over the last year, over some time period. And to me, that is a shocking statistic, given how few Americans have, have ever meet their senator, have any contact. And that that, that pathway the way that concentrated wealth is able to exert its, its influence on the political outcomes is something that political, science have now, political scientists have now spent a long time studying. And there's a lot of evidence that this affects what's on the agenda, but it also affects what's getting passed. There's new research that shows that um, in the United States, uh, things aren't getting passed into law unless they are supported by elites.
Um, so even something, so something that everybody supports, likely to get passed into law, but something that you know only poor working class families support, less likely. But the subversions of our market, um, and we can, so sorry, I knew I was going to forget this slide. And we can see this, of course, in the United States. We have this long-term decline in the rate of taxation that we are doing at the very top of the income distribution. And this, of course, connected to the lack of public investment, because we're, we're, we are um, at a place where we don't have the revenues to make these investments, but we live in this world where the priority uh, has become tax cuts at the top rather than these public investments that would grow our economy. But it isn't just the subversion of the political process. I think just as deep and just as important are the subversions that market concentration is bringing to the markets themselves. So when you have some entities that have enormous um, uh, economic power, they are able to write the rules of how this market will work. Um, and so I wanted to show you just a slide here on um, uh, in the United States, we're seeing much, and this is just emblematic of a whole bunch of different things that we could show in terms of the fact that we are no longer enforcing our what are called antitrust provisions, that is provisions against monopolies and oligopolies in the way that we used to. And um, this, this chart only goes back to 1990, but this shift in how we enforce antitrust actually started in the 60s and 70s brought on by economists who said that, well, markets can just work. We don't need government to make sure that markets um, uh, do their thing, right? Because there, if you just have competition, somebody will come in and, and we don't need to do so much regulation of them. But as we've seen, we've seen this rise in market concentration and a lack of enforcement of that, which is, um, of course, go hand in hand. So um, the, uh, I want to just pause for, for a couple other points on the market concentration point. So it isn't just that we see this subversion in terms of how markets are working for other producers, right? Often when we think or talk about monopoly or oligopoly, we're thinking about well, what does it mean if you have um, someone like Amazon who is sort of owning the platform for selling books in you know, this retail market online and they are um, making it impossible for new uh, um, producers to come up, you know, they're sort of the first one there and so now they're owning this space and there's a lot of evidence that they are clamping down on competition and buying up competitors and sometimes, you know, killing these products and all the different things that they're doing to maintain their stranglehold. But the flip side to that is that this rise in market concentration is also creating a situation where increasingly workers are working in what economists call monopsony labor markets. It's a terrible word because it's difficult to say and difficult to remember what it means. Um, but what it means is that increasingly um, workers are in a labor market where there's either only one or just a handful of potential employers. So for example, if you're a nurse in many communities all across the United States, maybe there's five hospitals, but they're all owned by the same corporation. So if you get into trouble with your boss or you don't like the, um, the standards of that hospital or you don't think that what the hospital's doing are in the patient's best interest, you don't really have a lot of options. You might be able to go to one of these other hospitals, but it's run by the same company. You're gonna get the same wage and benefit package most likely and the same health and safety standards. You're not, you don't have, the, there is no competition in the same way for workers to be able to choose um, different employers. And of course, that has an impact on working conditions and on pay and um, compensation more generally. So it is the case that as we've seen this rise of market concentration, that's been associated with, an, in, with a decline in the capacity of um, workers to be able to bargain collectively inside workplaces. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I did not at some point um, show something to do with union organizing in the United States. We're at the bottom here. Um, we're bold. We're very small. Um, uh, the, it's actually fun fact. That was sarcasm. Fun fact. Um, in the United States, um, there are fewer people in unions as a share of the private sector workforce than there were before we made it legal to bargain collectively in the 1930s. So we're right back to before um, uh, where we belong. But I, I show this here, I mean, it's a little bit of a, of a tangent, but just as we see this rise in monopsony power, we're also seeing a, a decline in workers to be able to bargain collectively on their own behalf through institutional mechanisms. <clears throat> 
All right. I'm going to run out of time if I do not get to my last, um, my last way that inequality constricts growth, which is that inequality constricts growth by distorting demand through effects on both consumption and investment. Now, I think that the effects of inequality on demand are fairly straightforward, right? If you have a rise of inequality and you've got some people that have more and more money and some people that have less, clearly that's going to affect you know, how demand happens, right? Because there's all these people at the top that have the money and, these, and folks at the bottom that don't. And that literature is fairly robust. Um, there's been a whole new um, body of work in the United States really proving um, uh, Milton Friedman wrong that uh, it is true that lower income people have a much higher marginal propensity to consume. Um, which, you know, again, uh, Milton Friedman did not have access to the kinds of data that we do today. Uh, so that's one thing, but I want to pause on the investment story, because I think this is actually where um, we don't know enough, we don't talk about it enough, and where I think it's a very important story about the ways that inequality is constricting growth through the pathway on investment. So um, one, to kind of go back to this um, inventor's point that I made earlier, uh, we um, funded a study that came out as a paper uh, about a year and a half ago by a scholar named um, uh, Xavier Yerevel. Um, and he looked at what rising inequality does to inflation. And he found that because there is now this rising demand for goods and services up among those at the very top of the income distribution, and a lack of demand and not really a lot of money among those at the bottom, Producers are increasingly focusing their, their energy, their attention on goods and services at the top, and so there's more product um, differentiation. There's more competition among products at the top than there is at the bottom. So um, uh, there is, we have a great example. Uh, he had some, well, it was beer. That's what it was. I'm like, what was the great example he was talking about? So beer, right? So, so if you have this great sort of product differentiation in the United States of like, you know, cr you know, handcrafted beers and the like for high-end markets, and you still have like the same, like, same beer at the bottom. You're not, you don't see that product differentiation or that competition. So what that means is that he actually shows that there is higher inflation for those at the bottom than for those at the top. Which makes no sense, because you got no money. You, these, people, these people can't afford higher inflation, but because you don't see that market competition able to bring down prices in the same way, or it's not affecting the, the growth in the same way. Really interesting effect on the macro economy. Huge implications for how we think about monetary policy, right? If we can replicate that with other studies, this is definitely something we need to be thinking more about. But there's also evidence that market concentration is reducing uh, private sector investment. Um, there's a great new book out this fall by Thomas Philippon, and he focuses, he's done a lot of the cutting edge research on that. And there's also a number of other scholars showing that the, um, the, that the, the lack of investment in the, at the private, private sector investment where it should be, given where profits are, has to do with this rise of market concentration. And so this lack of a need to make investments to uh, outcompete somebody, if you're a monopolist, you don't have to worry about that so much, and so you're seeing less investment. Um, but the other uh, piece of the puzzle here, um, oh, that's what, I can't see my slides very well. So um, this is actually from Thomas Philippon's work. Uh, businesses don't invest as much as they used to. So this is, I'm looking at, so I've shown you that rise of market concentration, this decline in investment relative to operating um, surpluses. But then, I mean, in this, in this penultimate chapter of the book, I focus on this work by economists named Atif Mian and Amir Sufi. And I interview, I've interviewed all of the, in each chapter, I, I interview the economists, so there's these great quotes from them and these interviews that we published. And Atif talks about how the rise of wealth concentration is actually, um, in, in economics terms, if you have more, more savings, if you have more wealth, that should lead to more savings because the rich save more. And in economics terms, that's an identity with investment. So if you have more savings, you should automatically have more investment. Well, we're not seeing more investment and a good reason, a good, one of the reasons that Atif, Mian, and Amir Sufi look into that show this is that because so much of that increase in that wealth has actually been uh, pushed into the supply of credit. And not credit for firms, but credit for households. So they've done a lot of work on the financial crisis and what happens when you see concentrated wealth and the dysfunctional nature of wealth that is then not moving into investment, but moving into household credit because there's just simply too much of it. 
So I will pause there on that, and I just want to get to one final thing in my last couple of minutes here. So I hope I've given you at least some sense that there's a lot of new research and evidence that shows that there are a lot of ways that inequality is actually constricting growth the way that it obstructs, subverts, and distorts the pathways to economic growth and stability. And um, I would argue that addressing all three of these is vitally important from a policy perspective. I think, though, as I have done and sort of sat with all of this research um, over the past six years, that unless we deal with the subversive aspects of rising wealth concentration, it is virtually impossible to deal with the, either the obstructions or the distortions that dealing with the way that rising wealth concentration and rising market concentration is subverting our markets and our governance um, must be our number one priority while we're also dealing with the other two. But I don't think we can solve, we can't deal with the obstructions unless we, I think entirely, unless we deal with these subversions. Um, and that requires big structural changes, rethinking how we deal with the rise of market concentration, how we um, uh, address um, uh, competition across firms, um, how we think about taxing at the top. And all of those are actually things that, while we need to deal with them at a national level, probably also require international cooperation and agreement. So these are huge structural challenges. Um, at the same time, we need to continue to make investments to address obstructions. In the United States, I argue that um, one of the most important things we need to do is to make bigger investments in early childhood education and care. Um, but I want to end on a very positive note on something very easy that we can do. And that is we can change the way we measure economic growth. So when um, we typically, you know, in the United States every quarter, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, I don't know who does it here in the UK, but they release the new data on gross domestic product. They tell us how our economy is faring. And then they revise it many, many times over the year. And this is just a chart of average, you know, we just, this is the growth data from gross domestic product from 1963 to 2018. And, or 2016, just shows you, okay, so this is a sense of how the economy is performing. And this is, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this. Every news station um, in the country will be like, oh, this, is, this, is, this means something. Well, what if, instead of looking at this aggregate data, we disaggregated it, and we showed where that growth went to across the income distribution? So if you look at the chart, and apologies to anybody who's colorblind, I've got to put hashtags on this, but I've not done that yet. Um, but that green, there are those green bars in the top. The green stands for who has the money. That is the top 1%. And you can see that and if, you, if you look at the green and the purple, that is the top total 10%, the top 1% and the next 9%. That has become an increasing share of aggregate national income, aggregate GDP, year over year in the United States. You can see the bottom half, which is just the little blue, just the little blue down there at the bottom, right? That's what the bottom half gets. So as I showed you at the beginning, these charts that showed that we are no longer a nation that grows together, we need to change the way we talk about growth entirely so that it makes more sense and it's more resonant with what's actually happening in our economy and so that it pushes us to actually think about what inequality means rather than assuming that a rising tide will lift all boats. So we would like to see, this is what the current Bureau of Economic Analysis quarterly report looks like. That's great. What we want to see is this, that actually shows us how we disaggregate growth on a quarter by quarter basis so that we can see um, you know, what it looks like. So I will end, so I just, I like to end there because this is something we can do, it's easy. Um, uh, the statistical agencies can make it happen. There are folks working globally um, through the OECD and, and through the World Income Database to do this in other countries. Um, so it's a very exciting new development that changes the conversation. And I think that's really important because I said, as I said when I started, we believe that there's a paradigm shift happening in economics because of new data and evidence that shows the way that heterogeneity in all its forms across income and wealth and firms um, is shifting what we know about how the economy works and the role that inequality plays, and is particularly the role of rising economic concentration. But part of the problem is that you, if you, you can't talk about what you don't measure. And so thinking about putting that front and center for our policy debate seems like a good place to start.
So what I'd like to do is to actually look a bit at the question of theory first, mm -hmm. and then also to come into some of the policy conclusions. And the reason I'd love to talk to Heather about theory is I also forgot to say that we got our PhDs at the same time at the graduate faculty of the New School for Social Research in New York, which kind of prides itself to be one of the few places in the world that actually teaches different types of economic theory kind of properly, not just as history of economic thought. And I was really struck by um, your, one of your comments when you said that kind of the mainstream approach to thinking about inequality no longer works because things have actually changed kind of in the real world. And I just wanted to kind of step back and ask you, is that really the case or could it be that actually there always been some underlying problematic assumptions even when things look better on the empirical side with the actual theoretical approach itself because you did talk about demand and that makes one think maybe of some Keynesian analysis. You looked at the distribution of wages and profits or the post-Keynesian kind of contribution your own work when you were doing a PhD on the kind of structuralist yeah. and the dimension. If you can just bring to life a bit the different kind of theoretical assumptions that maybe are also important still today um, even though there's this great data out there in driving also kind of policies or one's lens on inequality. It's a great, it's a big question and a great one. So I'm happy to start there. It, um, so I think that the thing about so much of what, um, what we learn in textbook neoclassical economics is that uh, some of it, it's so, it can be so powerful um, because, it, because it, it makes a lot of sense in small cases, right? Mm -hmm. Supply and demand. Right? You go to your local farmer's market and um, you know, supply and demand is at play. Right? If I'm like walking down the stands and I see strawberries, I'm not going to pay twice as much for the same good if somebody's selling it. Right? If you go, if you, like, there, there are places where you can see that markets work in this very textbook way. Right? The supply increases, that you know, the price will fall. And, and so that makes a lot of sense. Right? But the problem is that where you start the story, right? And I think that's where you get to theory. Where is it that you're starting the story matters, right? So when you're talking about, and I mean, I don't know why I'm picking on supply and demand. It's just easy to talk about with a big audience, right? When, but when you're talking about supply and demand, you're assuming, you start by assuming how much money people have in their pocket. You assume a budget constraint, right? And you're assuming that, um, that producers can act in a, in a certain time frame, right? You're not starting from the question of, well, how is it that that distribution of resources across a society, across different actors, how is that affecting where the, um, what steps are taken or where you start that conversation? So as I think about the, the theory pieces here, it seems to me that, um, and you see this, you see this in so much of economics, we have these theories of how the economy works and then so these textbook theories that we teach students in introductory courses, and then everything else is about the exceptions, and that those theories actually don't work, right? So um, uh, market competition, right? So there's this idea that we have this perfect competition. There's an infinitesimal number of firms. They're infinitesimal and small. Nobody can affect outcomes. OK, well, that's what you learn in like the first class and on the first day. And then you spend the rest of your career in economics being like, oh, that's, that's not true. We always have imperfect competition. So what does that really look like in the real world? And so I think that when you start from this question, but the, but the, um, the greater equity you have may affect the veracity of those, of um, whether or not those, that theory looks make sense in the real world, right? So perfect competition is a good example. If you don't have any market concentration, if you have markets where there, there are a large number of players, then it's going to look closer to what that textbook shows than all of the other imperfections, which are really what's happening in the real world. Um, and you might be more confused in an era of greater equity than you would be in a, in a greater of less equity. But I think that the, um, the other piece that I think is so profoundly important here is that so much of economics starts from the presumption that markets are these wondrous things that work, right? We call it perfect competition for a reason because it's, it is, it's this perfect thing and it's better at distributing, supposedly, resources um, and efforts than people and governments, right? So much of what we have in economics came out of a time, you know, it was, it was this, it was a theory developed out of a place where 
you had these new markets emerging. People were excited about the power of that. But we've spent, but I think what gets me is that we've spent 40 years, at least in the United States, destroying the very institutions that made these markets possible. And so that's where you get to the structuralist approach, right? If you start from the perspective that markets can just work on their own, that they aren't, they aren't created by humans, that they are just this sui generis magical thing, you're gonna get to a very different answer than if you start from the perspective of actually it is humans working together through private and public entities that create the parameters of markets. It's, humans have decided what a patent is. We've decided you know, whether or not you can you know, get a government, um, uh, get the power of government to give you this patent and to keep other people from using it. These are all institutions that make markets work. And so I think what, what I'm trying to push on here with this analysis is that high concentrations of wealth and power means essentially high concentrations of social and political power and that distorts the way all of these markets work. The market was never perfect. It was always formed by institutions. And without that, you can't do them. So you ask about theory, and I, I kind of go back to this. It, it starts by understanding that this is a social, it's a social process. And while there might be some, some, some things that, uh, that happen in any economy, um, uh, you really do need to start from the social side. And starting from distribution gives you a deeper sense of what's happening. Really interesting also because a lot of what we do in the Institute is precisely to kind of start off by saying that because markets are deeply embedded in different types of institutions, norms, laws, and these different types of actors where markets are the outcomes of those activities, then actually what we need to drive policy is not so much a market fixing framework, but one that is more about co-creating and co-shaping, including how do we actually govern say the patent system. Yeah. Anyway, so another question, and sorry, it's still about theory, and then we'll go to yeah. some policy questions before we open up. Um, you had qu uh, at least two or three slides, I think they were all from Philippon, um, about market power mm -hmm. and concentration. Um, and there's different ways one can look at that. So you can look at kind of rents and economic rents as, again, an imperfection that can be competed away. <clears throat> or you can look at certain types of rents as, again, deeply embedded in how the system itself works. I think Marx himself used to say that you know, the problem is not that workers are getting cheated, actually how the system itself is working when it works best under the rules, they're still getting a really raw deal. So you yeah. need to look at it not through that kind of imperfect view. But I wanna bring back your latest point about an imperfection view of the market to this notion of rents and where do rents actually come from? Because Stiglitz himself is, of course, a you know, progressive economist and he's been fighting for all sorts of policies that reduce inequality. He's coming to the concept of rent really from what he won the Nobel Prize for, yeah. which is asymmetric you know, power and asymmetric information and, again, market failures. So what's a heterodox view of rents? Uh -huh. um, or how, you know, does it matter? You know, does one's view of what rent is in the economy matter to then how one fights the issues around concentration and its effects? It's so interesting. I, I'm going to take this in maybe a slightly different direction than, mm -hmm. than you mean, but it, it, you know, when we talk about, so there's, there is, um, so does it matter? There are rents that happen in the marketplace, and then there's rents that are just are are or not redistributed by the state, mm -hmm. right? And so I think what does matter, um, and I think so to actually start that sentence over again, mm -hmm. one of the things that I think we've learned, especially as we've studied inequality over the past decade or 20 years or so, is that it isn't this either or of of you know what's happening in the economy and whether or not market competition is is eking is you know eliminating these rents and the role or or is it or is it the role of the state, but that it's it is this yes and and that the that the site of dealing with the problems in equality has to be about both of them, mm -hmm. um, so maybe again that's a, maybe a, a slightly different tact on it but it was a point that I kind of wanted to make so there you go. Um, but that, you know, so you mentioned Marx, so, right, so when you read Marx and you, and you think about what it is that we talk about how workers get control of rents that are happening in the process of production, it, it is this focus on what's happening in the site of production. It's a, it's a focus on worker bargaining power, it's a focus on unions, it's a focus on what's happening at the, in the, in the site, in the process of production. And he wrote about how, well, the government was just sort of this, this thing over here, that's not, that's not actually where the action is. 
And then you read Thomas Piketty, who comes in and says, well, actually, these, um, uh, this wealth that's being created in all of these different societies, it goes back 2,000 years, right, is um, being extracted and taken by elites in, across all of these different forms of the economy. And the only entity with the power to redistribute those rents is the power of the collective, which is a government. Right? You can think of a, a, a union is a collective of people in a particular shop or an industry, but it's the government which has that power to tax wealth. And so I think that, that there's something in, in, that we don't, I, I hope we start talking more about, mm -hmm. that there's something powerful in this yes and, that it is both sides of this. Um, and that where you know libertarians will tell you that the market is perfect and government is always flawed, and then there's some people who will tell you, well, no, the government is a solution to all our problems and markets, or you can't trust them. But it, it's not this either or, but that there is this place in the middle where you're trying to corral the power of both the state and at the private side in private entities to make sure that those rents are being eliminated, reduced, distributed in ways that are fairer and more just. Assuming, I'm just assuming that our outcome that we all want is a, uh, is a more just society. So I probably should have said that at the beginning, that I do have a value system that I am overlaying my economics onto. <laughs> so one of the really interesting things I think that you bring to the table, and again, others maybe have sort of talked about it through their empirical work, but by bringing all these different uh, um, conclusions from different studies, you really kind of resonate it, which is that how you think about growth, the direction of growth, needs to be happening at the same time that one thinks about the you know, inclusive growth. Yeah. So for example, innovation-led, investment-led growth, as opposed to in this country, for example, we're still growing mainly through consumption. That consumption yeah. is being fueled by private debt, so the ratio of private debt to disposable yeah. income is back at record levels. But even if you have investment-led and not consumption-led growth, what are we investing in? Yeah. And so obviously there's lots of talk around the world now in you know, green transition, the Green New Deal, directing innovation and investment in green ways, not in brown ways and dirty ways. Um, where are the interesting discussions, experiments, policies happening where this discussion about green and directed growth and directed innovation is at the same time a discussion about you know, tackling inequality so that the two things are happening at the same time rather than waiting for things to screw up and then using taxation to redistribute. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll give you two examples. So, I mean, one, of course, um, I'm sure folks here are familiar, the, um, the folks that have been pushing the Green New Deal, that, is their ex that was their explicit focus, was to connect the dots between how is it that we create a more, I mean, when you, I mean many of the folks that were sort of at the forefront of that weren't environmentalists. They were thinking about, not, not necessarily, but thinking about you know, how we create a more just economy and you know, pulling in this need to make these investments and also understanding that if we don't deal with the environmental issues, they're gonna hurt folks at the bottom of the income ladder the most. So I'm excited about that, although you know, it, it feels very, we just, the U.S. just pulled out of the Paris you know, Accord, so I don't know, it, it also feels uh, very, very challenging. But another place where we see a lot of these conversations with a slightly different lens, so not the, not the green lens, but the connecting the dots mm -hmm. lens, is in these conversations around the, what, what they call the future of work. Um, so, I, so I spoke at the, the state of California put together this big commission um, to investigate the future of work. What is the role of technology and artificial intelligence? And uh, what does that mean for workers, right? And sort of this fear or this sense that, oh, okay, well, we're gonna, there's all these robots are being created and there's gonna be driverless cars and um, there's all these people who are truck drivers and now they're not gonna have jobs and oh my goodness, what's gonna happen? What are we gonna do? Um, and um, I, say, I spoke at this commission a few months ago and what was really exciting was that, um, you know, biggest state in the country, refocusing that conversation on starting from the question of distribution, mm -hmm. right? So if you want to understand what the future of jobs are, you need to start from this question, well, who is it that is, that is building these robots? Why, why, why do this small number of people sort of have the patents over the, all of the learning of human history, that like one person then made the right app at the right time and got to sort of control this whole market. Like there's like new questions around that. Like what does that mean? How do we open that up? But then what does it mean if you have all this technology for workers um, and who own, essentially who owns those robots and what are they doing with that? So I feel like that conversation could be a model for how we think about to connecting the dots on the climate which is um, you know, who needs to be making those investments, who are they for, but 
also kind of not um, seeding uh, this technological determinism that you know, that 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 a small number of people are going to own all of these resources. Right. That's very interesting because that again connects something we work on, which is that how you know like who owns what and why mm -hmm. is equally relevant right now in the green transitions, very different structure, for example, of ownership of even renewable energy in Denmark, yeah. say, versus uh, the US, but also in our data systems. So we're working, for example, with the city of Barcelona, where they're thinking about you know data trusts and public repositories yes. of the data. So every time you click on city mapper, data is generated instead of it going straight to a company, then we worry about taxing it. And privacy issues, it's that so... data itself goes straight to improving public services like public transport. Yeah. So that again brings it back to institutions and structures as opposed to always just fixing some sort of imperfection. So getting it right ex ante. Anyway, so time tells us here that now we can open it up to the floor. Uh, hi, Heather, I'm Zach. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, firstly, I just, well, I just wanted to ask how big of an influence, um, you mentioned Stiglitz actually, um, how big the price of inequality was for your book and what do we know now that we didn't know back then on this topic? Right. Want to take three questions at once? Yeah. So basically, okay, got it. Um, hi. Um, admittedly, I have eight questions, but I'm only going to annoy you with one. Um, uh, what should the next class of elites look like or be like, or what would the virtue of next class of elites in terms of their behavior be in terms of your expectations? Insofar as if we expect inequality not to be erased, but if we want to have a different kind of investment strategy, what should we be asking? of um, people in the 1% and how do we frame that conversation? Mm -hmm. okay. Are there any women? Yep, in the back. Sorry, man. <laughs> 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 we'll come back to you. You'll be the first other. Then. I'm just wondering how optimistic you are and what strategies you see happening and if you see anything that has a kind of lifespan that extends past the shelf life of the average kind of political term. And so where you can see substantive change and in which way do you see that happening? Great. The price of inequality is like less 1%, what we, want, what we want from them, and optimism. Yeah. Um, so I take this first question to be, how is my book different than Stiglitz's? Is that basically what you're asking? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I think, um, so we do have a lot more data than we had before. And I think actually what's changed, it's ironic. So when was that book written? That came out in 2011, uh, yeah, early 2012. Um, but in November of 2011, uh, uh, Joe Stiglitz and I um, put together a convening of about 40 economists. Um, there was, uh, uh, Bob Sola was also there. So we had two Nobel laureates and these 40 economists mm -hmm. to look at this question of whether and how the strength of the middle class and inequality affected economic outcomes. And it was just a full day of like whiteboarding and brainstorming with these economists to figure out, to think about how. Um, and this is sort of, I think his book was already in, cop in the copy edit phase before it came out. And I think what is actually interesting is that in that conversation with that group of people, many of whom are sort of ended up being on the advisory boards as we launched equitable growth, but, um, and, and we've, we've kept touch with, but in that conversation, the economists concluded basically of, of the 10 ways that they thought inequality affected um, the economy, that most of them weren't in their wheelhouse. It was, oh, well, inequality affects um, political outcomes um, and it leads to corruption or it leads to too much fin financial aid, they, all these sorts of things. But they're like, but that, those aren't our problems. Those are, there's sort of this confusion like, oh, that seems really important, but that's not what we do. And I think actually in the almost decade since then, what we're seeing is this amazing group of, we fund a lot of young scholars, graduate students, postdocs, um, uh, and work with a lot of young, young people. And you're seeing a lot of them actually questioning their role in understanding those. So it was really exciting. Our postdoc from two years ago did this wonderful paper um, looking at uh, similar questions to the chart I showed on the effects of um, monopoly, like why is it that we've seen lower investment and in coming to the conclusion that it was monopoly. And so, so kind of connecting the dots between these economic outcomes and these other kind of uh, political or social things that they were kind of like, well, these aren't our wheelhouse, but kind of in, doing a better job integrating that. So, and that's much of the work that I highlight. Um, so 
Um, and I am very, most of the people, I, the, the six scholars I highlighted are younger than me. So it's like this is this next generation of people, which I think is you know, also a difference. So that's one. Um, uh, what should the next class of elites look like? Um, what are we asking them? I think that it's such an important question. Um, I think, I mean, I think there are sort of two big questions that we have. Um, one is, um, you know, what kind of world do we want to live in? And I would argue that we're not going to be able to fix the climate problems unless we deal with the economic inequality problems. I mean, they go hand in hand, and it, both the political capacity to address climate change and who will be hurt and who will pay for it are essentially economic and inequality questions. So you have to put that front and center in any solution, but it is going to require um, it's going to require elites get on board, and so I think that that's one. But putting those two together, I think, is really important. But then the other thing is, is that we have to. Part of what makes a market economy so um, amazing and seductive and wonderful, and what we like about it, is that we create all of these these new things, these things that we want, right? We're able to create these these fancy phones and this technology and all the stuff, right, that we're able to, to do and to create with it. And um, that creates this vitality that comes from, in many ways, not just entrepreneurs and innovators, but you're allowing everyone to kind of find their best fit in an economy. And I think helping elites understand that if we allow the kind of concentration that we have today to calcify and continue, we will be choking off that vitality, which both brings us all down, but it means that there won't be those, 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 that, I mean, I think you have to appeal to their sense of what, what they want for their children and for the next generation, and do they want that same kind of openness and understanding their role in human history if they don't, if they're not amenable to things like a wealth tax or changing how we tax capital. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's where I would go with it. Well, so in the U.S. context, I would ask them to stop opposing raising taxes at the top. Um, you know, we just passed in 2017 a very unpopular piece of tax legislation where the vast majority of the benefits went to those at the very top. And the only reason it passed is because elites were funding that effort and making that happen. Um, I, I mean, I think that, that seems really important. I would also ask them to invest in um, shoring up democracy in ways that are true and real and bring different voices into the fold that aren't elite voices. So, so because I think that's how we're going to get to the kinds of policy outcomes we want to see. Thank you for the clarification on the question. Mm -hmm. Why am I optimistic? I mean, I'm characterologically optimistic. Otherwise, I would have never been able to live for 20 years in Washington, D.C. So, I mean, but I realize it's a, I realize it's a character flaw. I mean, so it, it, it yeah, I, I mean, I think that, um, what, what makes me really optimistic is that we are now having a national conversation about taxing wealth that is very different than anything that I've seen over the past 20 years in Washington. That feels, that feels big. We're having a very different con conversation about market concentration, um, and that feels very big and um, that people are, are pushing. Um, I mean, I am not optimistic. Well, I will give you one piece of optimism from the current administration, which is that President Trump ran on a, um, uh, a platform of doing things that would improve the lives of regular families and working people. And in his very first press conference, I mean, he must have said the word, you know, jobs like 100 times. And he went out there that first week when he was in office, and he said to this carrier, this plant, um, and I believe it was Ohio, like, I don't, you can't move to Mexico, because they were saying they were going to you know, like eliminate all these jobs and move to Mexico. And he called them on the phone, and he said, you know, he, he made the case to, to the American people that we, in our democracy, can have some control over this thing called the economy, and we don't have to accept bad outcomes if they aren't good for our communities. <coughs> and that, I think, is a very powerful message, and one that clearly resonated with a lot of people. Um, I think the way that he's executed on that hasn't been great. He hasn't followed through. There's a whole bunch of problems. But the fact that that message resonated, um, I think, provides a lot of opportunity and opening 
for us to say that we actually, you know, we've solved all these problems before on the economic side. We started taxing you know, high incomes. We dealt with you know, market concentration. We did all that 100 years ago, and we've undone it. So we can do that again. Um, and, and I think people have an appetite for it. It's just whether or not our democracy can deliver it fast it, enough. If I can just add one thing, just yeah. also from our experience in talking to policymakers, something that's new that feels kind of optimistic is that this idea that Obama put out there on kind of we built that, right, which is it's not true that all the wealth is created in one place and then you just have to pick up the mess along the way, that the way we create wealth is itself, again, collectively created through all sorts of different actors, and yet then it gets distributed in a way that isn't as socialized as the work that actually went into creating it. That message is being put out by both the left and also strain, in some strange places even on the right. So Marco Rubio, yeah. we were just saying, yeah. just wrote this very interesting two reports where the first chapter is called An American Theory of Value. And he looks at why are we not reinvesting the value that's created in our communities and the workforce and human capital formation. And it's just interesting that it's a, I was going to say bipolar, but bipartisan. Um, <laughs> both uh, work. Anyway, yeah. three more questions. I feel bad that we took the microphone away from one person. And then Patricia in the middle there. <laughs> Pick on our students. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming. It's a very insightful talk. Uh, I'd just like to ask that given the change, that, given, given the way we should think about growth and the way we think it, we should change that thought, what changes would you like to see in monetary policy and the way we seek to stabilize growth and in prices through the interest rate mechanism and through quantitative easing? Thank you. Patricia here in the middle. Okay. Oh, I see she comes here. Just pass it on to her. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Um, my own question is really about international and global inequality. Um, uh, obviously, that the gap is widening among um, developing countries and the, the, um, the um, developed countries. And also the role that migration from these poorer countries are having in the, gap, the gaps in the developed countries. In other words, you have a lot of people risking their lives, you know, to cross the seas, to get to um, developed countries. And then they arrive there, and they're at the bottom of the pyramid there. And that in itself probably will be adding to the statistics that you're having in terms of um, the, the widening gaps in the U.S. And, um, and in Europe and, and so on and so forth. But most um, of concern is really um, what are the factors that affect the widening gap between developed nations and the developing nations. Yeah. I got it here. Okay, one more. Oh, God, I feel Hello? terrible. Sorry? Oh, you have the microphone. Oh, well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you're, you're, I got it, yeah. Um, you touched on labor organization. Mm -hmm. uh, as a child in this country in the 1960s, I could genuinely name more trade union leaders than members of uh, the cabinet. Mm. And a lot of those trade union officials went on to become members of parliament, completely disappeared now with the politicization of the political class. So my, my question, that's a huge loss of influence for working class and less well-off communities. Do you see any scope for return to that level of labor organization? Mm. Yeah. Since there are so many questions, answer yeah. them all quickly. So I will, another yes. 10 questions. Yes, <laughs> okay, so that sounds great. Um, let me, I'll just start, I'll go in reverse order. I'll start with this one. I, I mean, I think that, I'm actually glad that you pointed out that um, the decline in unions means a lack of influence in the political process. That, I mean, you know, we think of it as uh, something that affects workers on the shop floor, but it's, uh, where I work, I mean, it's, it's just as important, right? Um, because you don't have a voice. And I would argue that the reason that we've seen the demise in how we think about market concentration and what's happened with taxes and revenue has been because you don't have those voices with power. You have nothing to balance that power of those elites. Um, uh, so uh, your question was, wait, I'm sorry, I got. Oh, return, mm. right. But what we can do about it, right. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, I'm actually, so I'm going to give, there's a hopeful one here. So in January, there's this group um, uh, run by two scholars, two you know, former uh, Sharon Block, uh, who worked for uh, Senator Kennedy and worked for the Obama administration, and Ben Fine um, at Harvard. Mm. And they're coming out with this. They have been working for the past two years to come up with, um, a, they call it the Clean Slate Project. Like, mm. okay, they brought together all the people, and it's like, what are we going to do? 
Like this, this is not working out for us well in terms of where unions are. What are we going to do about it? And there's this great new research from Suresh Naidu that looks at the historical, that gives us new historical data on union coverage in the United States. And what you learn from that is, is that we made it legal to bargain collectively, and the rate of unionization shot up, and then it's been falling ever since. So that that moment, that moment where you can sort of create that that big boom. Like if you have a lot of people talking about it and thinking about it and coming up with new ideas, maybe we can figure out a way to, to make that happen again. I think sectoral bargaining is probably uh, something that people are finally putting front and center, but we'll see when the report comes out in January. So that's something to watch for. Um, I'm going to go to the monetary policy question second. Um, so on that one, I think so uh, in the United States, the monetary authority is responsible for unemployment and you know, the employment level and inflation. Um, but I think that they need to start thinking about the ways that inequality affects the um, uh, effect that it affects I mean, being redundant affects the effectiveness of their toolbox. So one of the things that in the last two chapters that I focused on on consumption and investment that that these trends in inequality it's clear that they change the way that interest rate policy and fiscal policy work their way through the economy. Um, and 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 but yet the Fed and the Fed is starting to look into this, but I think that seems like a really important place that they need to devote time and energy to thinking about. Mm. Um, I also do think that they need to understand the consequences of their mandate on inequality because it affects the effectiveness of their tools, right? And so I think there really we need to definitely understand if you if interest rates are at zero in the next recession as they are likely to be very quickly and you're going to go with all of these other ways of shoring up the economy we're seeing those tools are less effective and they've massively led, they've they've supported greater wealth concentration which is also economically destabilizing so they need to start putting those pieces together um, and on the international not my issue area, so I probably don't have anything to say. You probably know more than I do, I'm guessing, based on the sophistication of your question. Um, but I would say that, um, uh, that so my understanding is that there's there, that part of, you know, I'm often, I've been corrected by my friend Branko Milanovic, who has a new book out. Um, we only release books at the same time, it seems. <laughs> um, but, you know, he did that famous elephant curve, mm -hmm. you know, showing He presented that, it here. Oh, good, great. Okay, so, so yeah. So watch that video, but um, but he, um, you know, this idea that that heightened inequality in um, many developed countries also associated with with reductions in poverty in other countries. It's a compli It seems to be a complicated dance that's happening. Um, but I will stop there because I don't think I can add much. Just one thing. I'm not so sure, and again, if someone else knows the actual facts, but some of the work has shown that actually, kind of north south, there's been convergence. Yeah but divergence like at the postcode level. So the greater London kind of metropolitan area, same thing in New York, like massively increasing inequality. Um, so it's more local rather than kind of the big old blocks that developing, um, that development economists used to look at. Yeah, all right, that's three more. Right, I'm like, just gonna let you guys, and yeah, Susan. Hi. Um, my question sounds like a techie one, but I don't think it this is. This is Sue Himmelbeit, very famous oh, feminist economist. Yes. <laughs> um, what did you do about, in, in dividing up real GDP like that, you can't really divide GDP, <coughs> you're, you're looking at incomes. And so my question is, what did you do about the state? Because if you take an account of final incomes, including benefits in kind, um, taxes paid, the whole lot, public services, you would have found, at least in this country, a much more shocking picture than you've got there. You would have found that the incomes of the bottom went down mm -hmm. while the incomes of the higher ones went up. So my view, if we're going to measure what matters, we, that's what one should be measuring. Yes. Got it. Hiya. Oh, I've got the mic, so. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, uh, Dan. Thank you very much for your talk. Really interesting. Um, just wondering whether you think it matters how we get to greater equality in terms of um, whether kind of tax and redistribution is equally effective as changing the wage share and profit share, um, and, and whether you see different outcomes for different ways of getting to, to the same final place. Mm -hmm. Such a great question. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much. So when I think of the US, I think of the, of the picture, the starkest picture, which is um, increase in inequality in um, the Bay Area. So latest statistics, I was just reading more people uh, homeless in the Bay Area than in the whole of the UK. And obviously a lot of uh, capital in there. So what would you do there practically? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, okay. So let me, um, let me, I'll just go in order. So that's a great question on, on the dividing GDP. So let me just note first, because I, I skimmed over it. I probably didn't say, it, but this is all data from, uh, Piketty, from, um, uh, Saez and Zuckman. Um, and Piketty, Saez, and Zuckman that uh, have done this distributional national accounts data, um, and they're doing this through their world income database for other countries. The, so it's not, I did not create that. Um, uh, but the, um, what they do, hi, <laughs> is they allocate, I'm sorry, I just saw somebody, I knew up there, I felt really good for a second. I was like, oh my God, a friendly face. Um, not that you all, you always are very polite. <laughs> lovely, lovely audience here. Um, but um, what they what they do is they um, allocate. So so yes, on the tax and transfers, they allocate that. But then they also allocate all of the other parts of government. So national defense and all this other spending, which does then have the effect of bringing up incomes at the bottom. So there's a there is a technical mm -hmm. debate about that. I'm happy to. Um, Direct you to some to some papers on this because I don't I don't feel like uh, uh, like I have all the ins and outs in my head up here, but I do want to note on your point at the end about you know if we were going to measure what matters that we would focus on that. I think that so. I work in Washington D.C. and think about how it is that people outside of academia talk about the economy. And I think that one of the things that is so challenging for us is that we have one, com and you know, I, I, I go in different, um, I'm often, I, I train, uh, I, I, my career has taken me into different kinds of rooms, right? I wrote a book on work family. You can imagine what the demographics of that room look like, right? And then when you talk about monetary policy or innovation, the rooms tend to look very different. Um, and over in one side of economics, we're having this conversation about growth, we're having this conversation about things that are sort of, you know, what, what the economy is. And then in other rooms, we're talking about people or families or things that we value that matter. And I, for one, am enormously frustrated by that divide um, because they're the same thing. It's the same conversation, but it's different people putting different emphasis, and it's about the metrics that we're using to talk about it. So if, and when we started equitable growth, we did this analysis of media um, and inequality. And what we found is that the media talks about inequality in big feature stories that are irregular. Oh, they've got this story that they're going to tell about rising poverty or what's happening in the Bay Area and homelessness. Like it's a story about inequality, right? This feature. Or it's like the once a year that you get the data from the Census Bureau that tells you family incomes. We talk about the economy every day. Stock markets, the GDP comes out every month, right? You have this, bit, but they're very different story. Like you have this regular mm -hmm. stuff that's coming out over here. You've got unemployment, um, and that is kind of what's a bit here, but that's like a sad story. It's not about what's happening to all families. It's what's happening to the, fa the, the, the ones that can't get a job, right? And that's usually less than double digits. So it's by definition, you're talking about this small, this small number, right? And I think what's powerful about reframing the conversation around GDP is that you're taking something that everybody already knows that is the economy and showing how it's about the people and who's benefiting and that you can show this across the, the um, across place. So that is my impassioned argument for why, and it's actually quite simple because we already have the data, you don't have to do anything new. Um, but that's my impassioned argument for why I think that doing this kind of measure would actually change our perceptions of what the economy is and it would bring that into all the rooms, bring the people into all the rooms. Was your point though about the welfare state and it's very different way it's being dismantled or not across the world and that that's not being captured? Oh, I did not hear that. Of, 
Oh, okay. That's what I, I yeah, had a okay. very different question. Okay. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. It's, it was a very interesting answer on a different question. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk no, about that fine. over yeah. drinks. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me move on. Sorry. Um, uh, um, how do we get to greater, um, wait, what did I write here? How do we get to greater equity? What was the second? Oh, God, I didn't write them because um, I thought you were taking. No, I, I was. Like yes. Oh, yes, got it. Yes, I think it does. I think it makes an enormous difference. Um, it is, I mean, the political challenges are very different, but the, but the political and social impact is very different. I mean, I think what you have to, I think what, what, we, what we see in the data is how the concentration of economic resources translates into political and social power. And so what is it that you're undoing, right? Mm -hmm. If you um, decide that we're going to break up Amazon, or we're going to break up Facebook. Let's use Facebook as an example, right? Because that's something that we've been talking about in the United States. We're going to break them up. Well, that has huge political and social ramifications, um, as well as economic ones. Um, and you're sort of going at the heart of a business model. There'll be replications for different firms, right? That's and and the consequences of that are going to be different than if we um, uh, wave a magic wand and we undo uh, uh, the 2017 mm -hmm. tax cuts for the wealthy. Right, which is going to affect all sorts of the, that'll affect directly a wider swath of people. Both of those are going to get it at the similar ways that concentrations of resources is subverting markets and and our governments, um, but it's going to do it in different ways. I I actually don't think that one is more important than the other. I think that that is and that's what you see. Right, is that all these ideas they fit together, right? And so the idea that you're going to deregulate and cut taxes because you believe that if we let the job creators do it and let the market do the, do its thing without supposed intervention that's a one coherent set of ideas a different co coherent set of ideas is that actually we need institutions that ensure that markets are effective um, and that they serve the public good and so that leads you to a very different set of an but they're but they're it's logic it, they fit together nicely and then the last one um, yeah, every time I go to San Francisco, I actually hate going to San Francisco mm -hmm. now. I used to love it, but it's the it's it is so it's such a huge problem. I don't if I I mean I don't have a quick mm -hmm. fix for that, um, but I do think that that is a, certainly a place where this rising um, uh, unfettered concentration. I, you I mean where you can see the damages. You can also see and you you see this with um, uh, we work. There's this very interesting case study in the paper this weekend. So WeWork is this company that does these, you know, little, uh, you can go and work in offices all around the world. It's great if you travel. Um, but they had this, you know, they got this, this huge sum of money. Um, and then, you know, uh, were not able to uh, launch their IPO at the level. Here, I'm, like, I'm going to go off on a tangent. But the, the point, the only point of this story that makes it interesting is that it, points to the fact that there's a lot of money floating around that doesn't seem to know where to make productive investments that will benefit humanity. You think about the $4.4 billion that was invested in WeWork, which seems great, but maybe it could have been better spent on solar panels or something else. And so how are we thinking about, not to pick on WeWork, but um, how are we thinking about the capacity to invest? And San Francisco just seems like a place where the lack of focus on what that, to use Mariana's mm -hmm. word, what that mission is, is such a failure of governance um, in, a, in, a, in a macro sense. And yet California has now this wealth fund uh, proposition by the governor and the team, which is, you know, how do you actually bring this, again, collectively created wealth, a percentage of it, not just through tax, into a public fund to invest in public goods? Um, yeah. It's interesting. It's, it's the state that's leading on that. Yeah. Well, they're doing great. Th I mean, I, I California. Just... No, but the idea is exactly not just to think about the redistributional issue, but actually get a share of the wealth that's being created by that social infrastructure to then fund social goods. They were talking about, I mean, yeah, um, they also, there were a couple of people in California that were playing about trying to do a California-only wealth tax, mm -hmm. which would not work, I think, um, because people would just, I mean, the fear would be that people would move. I mean, because it would have the same flaws that a wealth tax in the countries that have done it in Europe has uh, had, which is it, that it's, it's fairly easy for, for people to move across state. Mm -hmm. So you just move to Reno. I mean, Reno is not San Francisco, mm -hmm. but whatever. But you move, 
um, and can avoid that um, and is, is actually fueled a lot of the argument for why we need to do a wealth tax at the national level. So three more questions. Um, should we do Enrique in the front here? So uh, based on the experience that and we're let's doing. let's take five, five quick ones. So okay. I think <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm wondering how do you find the balance between sort of the word of redistribution and sort of perpetuating the idea of a passive role of the state in the sense now that we're working with local governments and where we're seeing a more active role in creating equity rather than yeah. waiting for others to create it and then redistribute it. So I'm, I'm wondering how do you find that balance and particularly in this discussion in redistribution at the local level. like mm. the sort of emphasis in equity and how do you manage equity? Because mm. like, local governments are, are more nimble than the national government to administer equity. So yeah. in that sense, if you can comment a bit. Okay. Yeah, hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, there's no easy way to say this, but um, back in 1973, I was in a sociology lecture and the lecturer wrote 10% of the country or this population owns 90% of the wealth. Well, that was back in 1973. Yeah. And so we haven't gone forward. We've just gone round in a circle. And the next bit isn't so easy to say. I mean, I'm a big fan of New York, and I, I love America. But first of all, the military-industrial complex, nobody's spoken about that. I mean, I feel sad to watch these graphs and charts. And to be honest, I think it's a big fail with a capital F. I can't see it as an economic model that the world should wish to follow. Mm. I feel so sorry for the American taxpayer with this declining investment, you know, these graphs all going down. How does the average American feel when they flick on the TV and they see their troops in Libya covertly or Iraq or Syria or Afghanistan and, and all that has to be paid for and yet they are left on the street, as this lady said, in San Francisco Bay Area, and the other chap said, I agree with him as well, that about the lack of trade unions, I think this really started to go wrong when in the Reagan Thatcher area when they cracked down on trade unions and, and they made it a non-inclusive society. So a society that is working for 10% of the population works not for the 90%. Hi. Yeah, a very quick question. You said that um, the number of uh, antitrust uh, companies um, being prosecuted for antitrust is going down. Is that because the number of sim is that number of prosecutions, or is that about the number of is that also a function of the fact the number of companies is going down because of the mergers and sort of monopolisation? Two more. I wonder if you had any historical data. Speak up, we can't hear you, sorry. I wonder whether you had historical data on where inequality was reduced and how did it behave to reduce? Was it that the top 1% came down or the top 50 mm. came up? Mm. Was it after a crisis or was it of a longer time period? Um, I, it was quite interesting to see the graph around market concentration and later the conversation around um, the uh, techno uh, kind of who owns the technology and the benefits. I was curious to understand your perspective or, or your thoughts on the concept of UBI or mm -hmm. the freedom dividend um, as a kind of combat combatant to um, the benefits of technology. Great. Um, I'm going to whip through these fairly quickly. Um, so on the historical data, so that... Um, that is, uh, so, so Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century talks a lot about that. But what we learn from that is that, um, uh, and, and I think actually, so I would direct you to that. But then second, I think your question is so interesting because you, you pointed out, oh, is it where in the income distribution? So important that we think about the whole distribution, right? It's not just about poverty and it's not just about the top. It's about what that looks like. And so, of course, it's looked different in different places, but... I will just pause there because I'm. Uh, we're now out of time, but so. But that's a great question. So I'm just flagging um, that. On the antitrust, it is the. Um, it's it's sort of it's all the things we've seen a decline in enforcement. 
We've seen a decline in the budget relative to the size of the economy. We've seen a reduction in the number of enforcers. We've seen a reduction in the number of cases being brought. So, I mean, it's just sort of like all, uh, across the gambit. We actually released this really fascinating, um, this economist at Yale, Fiona Scott Morton, did this literature review for us of all of the recent research in antitrust that has come out recently that, that, should, that um, points to how we need to shift our uh, policies, and it's basically a literature review. It's like these really, it's really sort of meta summary, but online you can get all the different papers. So if you're interested in that, you should check out our website because it's really quite rich and interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree with you. Yeah, that was depressing. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's. I feel like that, but actually, I was surprised at how much uh, in um, interest there was in me speaking. Um, in the UK um, rather than the United States. And I think it's actually, I think your, your questions, like are we a model, is I, I'm guessing a, a question. And that's one I would be asking if I was not an American. I mean, I'm trying to fix what we're doing, but I, I think there's a lot of, uh, this, this, this like word to the wise. Um, um, and then, so UBI, uh, I think, it's, uh, it's interesting. In some contexts, I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea. Um, you, asked, you asked that question. So, I mean, I think if we were to do a carbon tax and say that we would distribute the benefits across people that could look something like a UBI, um, that and I'm not opposed to that. I signed, there was a big letter that, that uh, economists, like 3,000 economists signed in the United States to do that, mostly because I would like to see something happen on carbon, and like if that's what people want to do, great, we need to do all the things. Um, but I do think that as a strategy, I don't think that a UBI is ever, like, I, I, it's not a strategy to deal with technological change, right? Because what does that mean exactly? I mean, what we have is the capacity for humans to spend less time working. Like nearly 100 years ago, John Maynard Keynes wrote that he was looking forward to his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, having 15-hour work weeks. And here we are, right? Yes, exactly. Every time I think of it, it's like, I laugh. It's like, this is ridiculous. We don't do that, but we have this technological capacity. And I feel like UBI is kind of selling that short um, and is focused on the, on, it's a poverty framework that I don't think is up to the task of really the challenges. I'm happy to talk more about that um, over drinks. And then, um, Carlota Perez, by the way, who's our honorary professor, talks about those two things together. Yeah. And actually says the opposite, which again, talk about it over drinks, but that she supports UBI precisely because we're living in a period where the technological capacity actually would allow us to restructure our working lives and work differently, yeah. and that UBI is kind of that important icing but on the would cake. It be, but, but yeah, but yeah. would it be big enough? Would it just be small? I mean, it just mm. it feels like, like when you kind of mm -hmm. like really start thinking about all the mm -hmm. details, it's like, what do you, what your, so your, I mean, my vision is that people work less but have a high standard of living but use less carbon, right? Mm -hmm. we've, got, we've got to do all the, mm -hmm. I don't know how the, man, mm -hmm. so this is, maybe we should go have drinks and talk yeah. about it. <laughs> then there, sorry, there was just that last oh, question oh, about sorry. equity and local. Yeah, what was that question? <laughs> sorry, I, just, I forgot the question. <laughs> it was like so long. So basically at the local government level, we have a bit of, we're observing a more active role of the government creating equity, not just redistributing what Others are so creating. City level strategies, so, like, exactly. like, like for, that Barcelona yeah. one, actually, yeah. in some ways. No? That was and new, new notions of equity, where equity, for instance, is now data ownership. So yeah. it's not just a sort of redoing the work of someone else, which sort of reinforces a passive role of the government. So I think it's just that balance between redistribution and not at continue yeah. doing the things as usual. And I, this question is keeping you from the drinks, so quick. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, it is. So I think, you know, I think one of the really interesting things that we've seen in our work with local governments around the country is how they're struggling with dealing with their own problems. So mm. San Francisco's got its own, they've got their homeless problem. They've, they're struggling to deal with this. Yeah. And how can they engage and support and think about this structural issues that we're talking about here? And that interplay, I think, is something that I'd like us to be focused more on. I don't think that's exactly where your, where your yeah. question is, but I feel like that, we're not seeing enough of that in the United States, in no small part because those state and local governments are so, they don't have enough capacity. Um, and because they're struggling with the real world implications of what this looks like for communities. And so it does feel like, going back to what, like if you ran a philanthropy, that's also another place to maybe think about how to support them so that they mm -hmm. can engage in actually fixing the problems which yeah. need to be done at a federal, international level. <laughs>
this was actually a key theme, and we have to finish here, in our um, seminar series that we ran in the last two terms. Uh, one of them was called Innovation in the Welfare State, and we had kind of eight different uh, events where we were talking about how do you reimagine what the welfare state needs even for, the type of public services, the future of mobility, yeah. healthy aging, how we think about the role of education to drive the kind of innovation yeah. and also to govern that in order to create more inclusive uh, growth. But instead of thinking about innovation here and kind of yeah. equitable things here, yeah. how you restructure the ways we actually produce and drive innovation itself and what it's for in terms of public services to capture that equity issue from the beginning as opposed to later. So anyway, round of applause yeah. for Heather. Yeah.